Um, our guest speaker this evening is Vinny Molina. He's the president of the Australian Cuban Friendship Society and has been since 1996. That's older than you. How old are you again? Um, four. Good boy. Uh, and the, Cuban, Cuban, the Australian Cuban Friendship Society started in 1994 uh, out of a few people thinking or being concerned really about the uh, US blockade on the, or the, US, the impact of the US blockade on Cuba. Uh, in particular, the children uh, being malnourished with things like milk or lack of milk. So the aims of the, of the Friendship Society is to create friendship between Cuba and Australia and uh, bring awareness of what the impacts are on uh, the people of Cuba with the blockade that's still happening. Um, Vinny recently returned from Cuba. He was there for three weeks guiding a tour group of Australians and New Zealanders of 30 people. And that group was part of the Southern Cross Brigade, um, which visits Cuba every December on a study, a work study tour. In Vinny's day job, he's the president of the CFMEU WA, the construction division, and that's the Construction, <coughs> Forestry, Mining, Energy Union. So would you please welcome Vinny Molina. Uh, but good evening and thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to also acknowledge the Aboriginal people, the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, always was, it always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. It brought memories to watch the documentary again. It has been out for, for a few years. I think that there is now a, a second part. The important thing is that actually works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as um, Benjamin mentioned, he, we just came back uh, from Cuba only last week after spending three weeks there. And it is amazing when you can see that working in community actually works. The working in community makes life for people much better. And when one of the guys, Roberto Perez, spoke there, often happens in our communities, we don't know our neighbors, we don't relate to them. Often uh, we don't even know if somebody has died and has been there for a few months, like it happened here before. In Cuba, it's, it's different. Um, something that does work there is that the government supports the community initiatives. And when uh, this is a special period that, uh, uh, thank God for the appearance, is finished, they really had to produce their own food. They were forced to do it. And you could see in balconies and everywhere people producing herbs and anything that they could actually get to, to eat. And the conversion of all vacant land into community gardens, where actually people went and work and and they help each other and, and they fill each other with, with the product, with the work. That was something that was very, very important to see. In Cuba, something that worked, and I stood for council a few years back with that great idea, that in Cuba, for example, in Havana, all the produce must be organic. The council introduced by laws. You can produce food, but must be organic. And when I stood for council, I thought, oh, that's something that we can do here. Mm -hmm. You know, we can actually put pressure on the people who represent us uh, at the local government level or state government to really introduce laws to protect the environment and to do something for the people. And that could be a fantastic idea, getting involved in the community. You know, I heard the previous speaker talk about streets and the trying to convert some of the vacant land into community gardens where we put pressure the councils that they introduced by laws about organic farming. That would be brilliant. <coughs> that is an example that Cuban actually showed. Now 100% of the produce in Havana is organic farming. And you can actually taste in the, the fruit and the veggies actually taste like, like real food. Um, we were staying in a, 
in a camp with um, the little it's people. Cool, and every day our food have those tomatoes that taste so nicely, the little bananas, uh, the cassava. Uh, it's so inspiring. And you know, it, you feel encouraged to eat and stuff. And when we visit Havana, you could see the, the markets that run by the people, by the producers. The Cubans discovered that at one stage, uh, the middleman was getting involved because the farmers didn't have the experience of how to, to trade the food. So they got rid of the, the middleman, the prices came down, and now the cooperatives and the farmers bring their own food and they sell it in the markets at a reasonable price. And there was a change in culture. In Latin America, we don't I come from Guatemala. Normally, we don't eat veggies, we don't eat salads, we love meat. And the Cubans were like that with the pork. You see, as an island, they had fish. They didn't like uh, seafood or vegetables or anything, or avocados. Today, that has changed. Well, the special period took 15 years in which Cuba had nothing. Uh, so the big camels, until now, they disappeared. And China has provided Cuba with around 2,000 buses, with eco uh, ecological buses uh, that are providing the transport for people. But in the provinces, you still see the, the, the horses with the carts. Um, the people are happy. And I think that one of the reasons people are happy is that they talk about the problems. You know, in meetings like this, people discuss what, what is the problem and how we can find solutions to fix them. And the local level and empowering the communities is so important, regardless if we live in a socialist society or in a capitalist society. We have a say. And if we get in, uh, organized, that can make a difference. Um, other thing I wanted to say that, that uh, mentioned that uh, we witnessed was that, uh, for example, in electricity, at that period, they were having a lot of um, blackouts. Sometimes up to 18 hours a day. There was no electricity. But they saw that the transmission lines, there was a lot of wastage. So what they've done is they decentralized. And now in every suburb, there is um, an ecological um, generator. And if that fails, the, the blackout is on a, a small scale. But also it protects the environment because all the wasted in the transmission lines uh, have been eliminated. They, they produce locally and they consume locally. So there is no commute of, you know, the trucks and the trains that we, we use here to transport, uh, transport the food, take it to coals or to bullets because they control the food production and distribution. So that's some of the lessons that we can take from the film and we can take from Cuba. And um, with the Australia Cuba Friendship Society, our aim is just to strengthen the friendship between the people of Cuba and Australia. And the aim with these brigades to go in December is to see by ourselves what happens there. Because while the information we receive through the mass media is quite biased about Cuba in particular, people don't know that the blockade is still in place. It is still affecting the Cuban people, in particular with medicines and milk for children. The main supplier of milk to Cuba is New Zealand. It's amazing, but you see how the milk has to travel from this part of the world to the other part of the world, and that could be avoided if the United States open their heart and say, listen, <laughs> we have to leave this blockade. It's silly. It affects people. It affects the American people. American people want to travel to Cuba freely. They can't. Unless they, they go, um, they are Cuban-Americans, or they have a specific reason to go there as academics or artists, they can't do it freely in the free world. So that type of contradictions that uh, sometimes is difficult to understand and not impossible to overcome mm -hmm. but when we stick together. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, happy to. Thank you. Um, thank you. time for one really good question and if you do want to ask a question and you miss out on that good question are you happy to stay a bit longer tonight yes i do to speak to people okay so we'll have one good question <laughs>
pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Someone who hasn't been to kinder, maybe. No questions? Okay, I've got an ordinary question in me. Yeah? <laughs> I, I haven't been to Q, but now I'm very inspired. Can you um, tell me something about the gender politics there? It looks like women had um, a really, I won't say necessarily equal, but how equal is it on a gender basis? Because they seem very involved in yes. leadership positions. You know, thanks. That's a, that's a good, uh, good question. Uh, probably Cuba has been able to provide women with access and to facilitate the possibility of higher education. The, as 60 percent of the scientists in Cuba are female. They also got the childcare access there. Free childcare centers in the workplace. So when you know here the problem moving from, to Cuba. Yes. <laughs> Issues like uh, well, superannuation, they don't yeah. have the problem there with superannuation because it, it doesn't help. Here it has created a problem for women because women when they have children and outside the workplace they have to retire in poverty. Now, over there it's very different. In parliament it's 48% and in higher positions you see a lot of women at the bosses there. So, which is very, very important and I feel very proud of that. Also it is very safe. To travel to Cuba as a filmmaker. Thanks for that. Once ready? Is there a lot of foreign investment in uh, Cuba and where does it come from? Uh, at the moment, uh, Canada, China, mm. Spain, Italy, and particularly they give priority to the Latin American countries, uh, a little bit from the United States, probably a level, a very in a small scale more into individuals, supporting individuals and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Venezuela got a lot. But just, just on that issue of uh, <coughs> foreign investment, um, uh, the Cuban government um, has very uh, strict uh, guidelines for uh, foreign investment, and if it doesn't benefit the, uh, the um, Cuban people, and they don't have uh, control over the finished product, then uh, they will um, not uh, allow that foreign investment there. And, and when I was in, when the brigades, I'll just come back to some of the women, um, they had a, a hotel that was being built outside of Trinidad. Um, you have to build the hotels outside of Trinidad because it's a UNESCO city and so There was a, a French uh, firm um, wanted to build a hotel there and they were given uh, like two years to build that hotel and then um, don't see where would they go from there. And uh, they weren't able to build that hotel and it was taken off them. And then um, another French consortium wanted to uh, have a go. And then they didn't finish it within the time and within the constraints that they were given. And then a, a Cuban entrepreneur took it over and he's, he's finished, or he's almost finished the hotel and um, it's uh, um, on track to uh, um, being built and and uh, even China um, sometimes has been asked to to uh, or has wanted to build or do something in Cuba but if it wasn't going to be owned or run in some way by the by the Cuban people and the Cuban government and they receive a, a benefit from it uh, then they've been told no you can't um, have that foreign investment so they're yeah they're very um, they don't want their society to be overrun um, and run um, by uh, foreign in, foreign uh, interests uh, okay. and so that's very very important and, and we could also uh, learn a bit uh, thanks, thanks for that Richard we've got to wrap up now so can we all thank Vinny for that <laughs>